Thank you for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, brutally cold temperatures expected to hit the Northeast. We've got the details. Plus, Holocaust survivor Hannah Mulka. For the Jews, everything changed. First of all, I couldn't go anymore to school. Then I couldn't speak with my friends, and I was, at my age, the only Jewish girl. She's sharing more of her story from the Holocaust and the lessons on how she endured. Then later, see why this Los Angeles center may be small in stature, but big on God's purpose for his life. Who I am in Jesus is definitely the most important thing. I try and live every day and every game and every shift like it's my last. All these stories and more coming up next from the CBN Newsroom. This is CBN News Watch. We begin this half hour with the dangerously cold weather moving into the Northeast today. Several states are bracing for what could be the coldest Arctic blast in years. CBN's Brody Carter has more in our top story. In New Hampshire, the governor warning the brutal cold is expected to bring severe wind chills. At negative 30 degrees, hypothermia can set in in just 10 minutes. And we know it's going to be even colder than that across the entire state. From Montana to the North Atlantic coast, several states are prepping for what could be an unprecedented cold spell over the next 36 to 48 hours. Single-digit temperatures are expected. States like New Hampshire and Maine expecting deadly temperatures. But with the wind chill forecasts really predicted to go below negative 40 degrees uh, in terms of wind chill virtually all across the state. In some places, the wind chill is forecast to be even worse at minus 60. And people across the affected areas are getting ready. I get my coat on and then my gloves are in my bag and I have my hat and I just bundle up as much as possible. Nearly 70 million people across the country are either under a cold, ice or flood alert. I'm not going to preach this, trust me. I got more than my blankets in that tent right there. In Portland, Maine, street teams are telling the homeless about warming shelters, but some refuse to heed caution. Because I'm going to stay here and make sure not only myself, but my neighbors, I'll stay warm. The warnings for the north come after ice, sleet and snow hit the south, turning some Texas roads into a sheet of ice. We slid on some black ice. You stay home. You stay safe. Hundreds of thousands of customers are still without power from Tennessee to Texas. We do not have an estimated time for restoration. And a travel nightmare for many is taking shape into the weekend with more than 700 flights canceled. And it's been tough for many of those staying at home. It was 29 the last night. Inside the home. Inside the home. I think it's cold, but we have covers. As Texas begins to thaw out of its multi-day ice storm, Punxsutawney Phil adding insult to injury with his forecast. I see that everyone knows their part, and I am merely the sage. But above all else, I see a shadow on my stage. And so, no matter how you measure, it's six more weeks of winter weather. The good news is, although the cold front is expected to last throughout the weekend, it's expected to end, leading to above average temperatures next week. Brody Carter, CBN News. I want to turn now to the economy. Record high inflation still rattling the country, but the labor market does continue to look strong. That is according to the new jobless claims report out this week. New jobless claims falling by 3,000 to 183,000. That's better than many economists expected and the lowest since April of last year. This all comes as continuing unemployment claims went down as well. 11,000 now around 1.6 million. Thousands of world leaders, activists and lawmakers met this week in Washington with the goal of shining a spotlight on those being persecuted for their faith. They're part of the International Religious Freedom Summit. Our Caitlin Burke brings us a look at this year's event and some of the top themes for the fight for freedom. The International Religious Freedom Summit was created to highlight and advance the issue of religious freedom for everyone, everywhere, all the time. With an uptick of global unrest over the last year, organizers believe that along with being a fundamental human right, religious freedom is also a significant foreign policy issue. The United States must continue to be a voice for the voiceless who are persecuted for their beliefs. In our very diverse world, Unless the right to freedom of religion exists for everyone, it doesn't truly exist for anyone. Despite differing political views, honorary congressional co-chairs Mike McCall and Jim McGovern expressed mutual concern about increasing religious persecution worldwide. Countries where religious freedoms are under attack 
are often countries where repression and instability are the norm. Protecting religious freedom isn't just about doing what's right. It's also a matter of national security. By resolving conflict, we can help prevent terrorism at home and abroad. As religious freedoms advance, conflict recedes. Former Ambassador-at-Large for International Religious Freedom Sam Brownback says this issue plays a significant role in current global events. Take Ukraine right now. Ukrainians splitting off a Ukrainian Orthodox Church from the Russian Orthodox Church was one of the things that caused Putin to move. He didn't want Ukraine to break out of the Russian world. It's Russia's ally China, however, that Brownback believes poses the greatest international threat to religious freedom. It's an authoritarian regime that's seeking to expand their model to an, and to export their technology to do it. Dr. Yang Zhan Li, a Chinese dissident and human rights activist, blames the Communist Party. Ultimately, the reason that China has no tolerance for faith is because the CCP wishes to replace human need to worship with a substitute religion centered around the party. Dr. Jean Lee says the evidence is clear. The world just needs to look at what's happened to the Uyghurs, Tibetans, and other faiths to see Beijing systematically eradicating anyone not completely in line with a party-centered allegiance. He's calling on governments to condemn this behavior in the same way they've united against Putin. Brownback says he hopes this summit will help push religious freedom to the next level, making it a top priority at every level of government. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Washington. Coming up, a Holocaust survivor shares her story. You're going to meet Hannah Malka right after this. Stay with us. Hannah Malka was 16 years old in March of 1939 when the Nazis marched into Czechoslovakia and took over her country in one night. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl shows us how she survived the ghetto Auschwitz and work in Germany to tell her story. Czechoslovakia was an exemplary democracy in Europe, and the Czechs never thought Adolf Hitler would make a move to invade it. But on March 16, 1939, the Czechs awoke to a new reality. I opened the radio and had the president say, be all of you quiet, don't fight, don't do anything. The Germans occupied Czechoslovakia. For teenager Hanna Malka and others like her, life wouldn't be the same. For the Jews, everything changed. First of all, I couldn't go anymore to school. Then I couldn't speak with my friends, and I was, at my age, the only Jewish girl. Hanna shared her story with journalists through a social it's initiative like called Zikaron Basalan, Living Room Remembrance. Founded 11 years ago in Israel, it's now in 65 countries, touching some 2 million people. It aims to connect Holocaust survivors with young people. Then we had to give half of our flat to a Jewish family because the Germans needed flats for the German. After that, we had to go to a small village, and it was very lonely and very, very bad, so my mother sent me to Prague. In the Czech capital's Jewish quarter, life continued for two and a half years. Then, in November 1941, Adolf Hitler said he was giving the Jews a city and began transporting them to the Theresienstadt ghetto. I was living in a flat of Czech family, so we were about 70 people in a two-room flat with one WC and with one place to wash themselves. For people of our age, it was actually, we could manage. We made each other and speak with, with other. I had always the feeling that everyone there wanted to give the best of himself so that to make other people a little more happy. Hitler used Theresienstadt for propaganda to deceive the world about what his true intentions were for the Jewish people. The children even put on an opera called Brundibar. And it said that Brundibar was a bad man who wanted to do bad to them and wanted to send them somewhere, but they were fighting against him, and in the end they succeeded to be the winners. Older people were deceived into paying money to go to Theresienstadt, thinking they were getting special treatment. Fifty people died every day. 
and all the time the Nazis were transporting people to Auschwitz in Poland. Eventually, Hannah and the other children were also loaded on a dark cattle car and forced to travel for days without food or water. The notorious Dr. Joseph Mengele was among those greeting them upon their arrival. He chose 200 girls, including Hannah, to be used as laborers and sent everyone else to the gas chambers. We had to put all down everything we wore. We were naked, and they took our hair, not only from the head, but from the body. Everyone got a dress, mostly a summer dress, and we asked where are all the other 1,500 people. And they told us, look to the sky and you see the smoke. These are the 1,500 people. Hannah and the 200 girls were then sent to Germany, and she spent the rest of the war as a maid or working in a factory for the Germans. According to Hannah, they always tried to guard their humanity. We wanted to, to stay people all the time. Maybe we didn't see like people, but, but we felt like people. As Germany began to fall, Hannah's life was once again in danger. They wanted to send us somewhere where they could finish us because they didn't want that the Allies should see what they made from us. But because of all these bombardments, they couldn't do it. After the war, Hannah returned to Prague, riding halfway on a Russian tank, and life began to return to normal. And then I didn't want to stay. The Russians came to Czechoslovakia. They were two people. They were the Russians and the, and the, and the Americans. And the Americans were good, but the Russians, not so much to speak about it. In 1946, Hannah came to pre-state Israel. Like many survivors, she didn't share her story for years. Hannah's granddaughter, Ya'ara Malka, who joins her at events, was a teenager when she first heard her grandmother's story. But the first time that I realized all the story is when I go with her to Germany. She talked in the schools, and then I got all the picture and understand everything. Hannah, who will soon be 100 years old, has two children, five grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. After all she went through, she says she wants people to remember, no matter how bad a situation is, there's something or someone good to be found. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Tel Aviv, Israel. And you can see more news from the Middle East on Jerusalem Dateline. You can find it on the CBN News channel at 8.30 Eastern. You can also download the CBN News app and watch it there. Still ahead, he's a dynamo on the ice. Los Angeles King Center, Blake Lazzotti. Hear how his small stature is his greatest strength and why he plays every game for the King as if it's his last. Welcome back to CBN News Watch. At the center of all the action is Blake Lazzotti. He is all over the ice as a professional hockey player. Although he gives almost everything in the game to his confidence, it doesn't come from his performance with the LA Kings. As Blake told sports reporter Tom Buring, his confidence comes from the King of Kings. Los Angeles Kings center Blake Lazzotti plays hockey and lives life with tenacious purpose. Who I am in Jesus is definitely the most important thing. I try and live every day and every game and every shift like it's my last. Undrafted and undersized, Blake's fueled both urgency and the ability to adapt from a young age. As a Minnesota boy and now playing in LA, do you have an appreciation for warmer markets? Minnesota is a whole lot different than uh, California and specifically LA. It's definitely a big change, but it's my opinion that outdoor hockey uh, in the winter, it's minus 10 degrees. That's hockey for me at its purest form. Whether you're, you're in that weather or you're in 75 and sunny on the beach, when you show up to the rink, it's still that same game and the game is growing. It's really cool that people aren't even really sure what ice hockey is until they show up at a game. Describe your on-ice style. My on-ice style and approach is just to play the game like it's my very last. Uh, you never know what's, what's promised. Just put your best foot forward each and every night. And, and for me, that's bringing energy and being tenacious on pucks. and and really playing the game for, for what it is, and that's just the amount of fun I get from playing hard. And for me, that's kind of what drives me, is just the joy of the game. Now your fourth full season, how has the game slowed down for you? It's the best league in the world for hockey, so 
things just happen so fast you have to read and react but i think the more comfortable you get the more games you play you kind of understand when you have time and when you don't so i think the biggest difference is is when i do get the puck i become more confident in making plays and, and not necessarily worrying about mistakes the game just slows down a little bit shorter stature in a very physical physical game how have you worked that as a strength i love the way you word that um, it is a strength of mine and my size. I'm not meant to play like six foot four and 225 pounds. And I'm just not that, God didn't give me that. So I had to learn how to find ways to, to be effective with my size and I created skills that really I can only play with a smaller stature. Having a lower center of gravity and kind of getting underneath those bigger players has really helped make me the player I am. Do you feel like you're driving more when you're at the center? For sure, yeah, you're way more involved in the game. You're all over the ice as a centerman, and it's exhausting and it's hard, but it's also the most rewarding because you're, you're involved in almost every play and you know, have the biggest influence on the game. You lost your dad when you were 14 years old. What has been that hard discovery through that pain to maneuver through it? You know, as a teenager, my sports family and community uh, was there for me. But I think ultimately it was Jesus Christ who, who helped me through that. You realize, you know, that life's not forever and why are we here on this earth? And for me, it was really hammered home when I lost my dad. My faith in, in Christ really got stronger through those years. He kind of embraced me and I think that's really the only thing that got me through. And still to this day, best advice dad gave that still lives, that it's shaped you. He's got a saying, it says live like that. I have a wristband that says it, and I actually got a tattoo that says that as well. Just a reminder to live like Jesus. My dad was a great example of, of what it means to pursue him daily and truly live a life that's glorifying to God and never wavering from that. Living like Jesus is the most important thing. Are you still able to maintain that sense of living life urgently? Yeah, I mean, definitely I try and keep that as a focus, um, but it can be hard. Lots of shiny things and distractions. Being who I am rooted in Christ, my identity is, is who I am in Christ and not in my, my hockey ability. Even though I give almost everything to this game and I love it um, dearly, but my confidence doesn't come from being a pro athlete. It comes from being a Christ follower and, and my security is in Him, not necessarily if I had a good game or a bad game. Proverbs 3.6 tells us in all of your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. I would conclude that probably a straight line on ice brings much faster results but how have you found over the years the crooked paths become beneficial for you yeah that's a, a great question a great observation i think god when you acknowledge him he wants to make your path straight straight line to him and that doesn't mean it's going to be easy there's going to be things coming your way you might think oh god why are you doing this to me to help shape who you are and, and build your relationship with christ and god just paves ways even through such things like my dad passing. Opportunities opened up for hockey that maybe wouldn't have been there before, and it's always easy to see back in hindsight uh, what God has done in your life, but being able to see God use something so negative to turn it so positive is something that's, that's truly amazing, and, and God works things out for good. Fitting for you to play for a king? Absolutely, yeah. Fully committing my life to the Lord has made me more of a competitor. I think God fights for our hearts each and every day, and God is fighting for our hearts harder than anyone has ever fought for anything on this earth before. I want to take up my cross every day and, and play like it's my last day, because playing for someone that's greater than yourself is, is something I think that always turns out to be, be for the best. Amen. Stay with us. We've got your Friday Faithful coming up right after this break. We'll be right back. matters. That is the view of the majority of American voters. That is according to a poll by Summit.org and McLaughlin and Associates. 67% believe public calls for prayer after a national tragedy are effective. About 20% said prayer is ineffective. 13% though aren't sure. The poll taken in the days after Buffalo Bills safety DeMar Hamlin suffered cardiac arrest after he collapsed on the field resulting in that nationwide outpouring of prayer. Many crediting those prayers with DeMar's miraculous survival and turnaround. 
Time now for your Friday faithful. I leave you with this thought as we wrap another week together. If you're breathing, there is divine purpose in you. It is not over. God is not done. There is more in store, more in your story. In fact, it gets greater later. With that word, I encourage you to make this a fabulous Friday and do yourself a favor. Have yourself a wonderful weekend on purpose and with purpose. Well, that will do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. You can always find more of our programs on the CBN News Channel. You can find them there at any time as well as online at CBNNews.com. We would love to know what you think about the stories you've seen here today or any day. You can email us. The address is right there at the bottom of your screen. It's newswatch at CBN.com. And of course, you can always reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We certainly would love to hear from you. Thank you for joining us today and all this week. We look forward to seeing you again right back here, same time Monday. Goodbye, everybody, and God bless.